1923 to 1926, a bubble emerges. The Roaring Twenties was going pretty smoothly in America. Electricity was becoming mainstream, the middle class was growing, radios, cars, factories were taking off, and the stock market was roaring higher and higher without much volatility. Investors made a nice 150% return for the stock market from 1922 to 1927, with the hottest tech stocks at the time leading the pack, Radio Shack and General Motors. Kinda similar to today. Success, prosperity, wealth became the new normal? What? Of course I own some stocks, what sucker doesn't? And what started out as a legitimate stock market that was growing due to real innovation, new technology, and more productivity, euphoric human greed takes over and a bubble emerges. And when a bubble forms and eventually pops, you want to know who suffers the most? Workers, employees. They have the least amount of savings and they're the first ones to get laid off. When a bubble crashes, you want to know who profits the most? Entrepreneurs, those who have a great business. Sure, they'll suffer a little, but they'll also be the ones with cash to take advantage of the greatest sale of a lifetime. That's where Trends comes in. The easiest way for you to find your next big idea. With a Trends membership, you'll get thousands of great business ideas and trends you can capitalize on straight into your inbox. Every week, their team of analysts put together a private report with dozens of ideas that can make you a million dollars, as it has for others. So you can build your business, stack some cash, which is what I'm doing right now, before the next potential market crash. Your next business idea is just an email away. Stick to the end to learn more or stop what you're doing right now, pause the video, and get your first week of trends for just $1 by going to trends.co slash jaketrend right now. The link is on the screen and in the video description below. 1927 to 1929, the bubble grows. In 1927, the Federal Reserve lowered interest rates from 4% to 3.5% for some unrelated reason. And this would be the spark that set the bubble in motion. See, when interest rates go lower, it becomes easier for people and businesses to borrow money. When interest rates are high, there is less borrowing because it's expensive. When interest rates are low, borrowing increases because it's cheaper. And when a person borrows money, he takes out a loan for a house, a car, stocks, a vacation, he has more money to spend. And when you spend money, someone else earns more money. Every dollar you spend, someone else earns and every dollar you earn, someone else has spent. So when you spend more, someone else earns more. So since the money you spend becomes another man's income, when you have more money to spend thanks to a shiny new loan you got because of a great low rate, the people you spend your money on also get richer. Because when a borrower receives credit, he is able to increase his spending. This is because one person's spending is another person's income. And the richer that person gets, the easier it is for him to get a bigger loan. The bigger loan he gets means the more money he can spend and give to the next guy, and that next guy can now qualify for an even bigger loan. And this whole process continues and propagates throughout the entire country until the whole economy is booming. So back to 1927, when the Federal Reserve lowered interest rates from 4% to 3.5%. Everyone started borrowing money to buy stocks, i.e. trading on margin. That newly created credit made stocks go higher, which encouraged more people to borrow more money to do the same. And from 1927 to 1930, just three years, stock prices more than doubled. What people didn't pay attention to was that the debt to buy those stocks also tripled at the exact same time, with many stocks trading at 30 times their earnings. Similar to 2008 and today with stocks trading at 39 times their earnings. All this growth attracted new investors that were never really into investing before, kind of like today. Wall Street invented new financial instruments to borrow even more money to make even higher returns, like things called call loans and investment trusts, as they always do like in 2008. We call them synthetic CDOs. What are you synthetic CDOs? Synthetic CDOs. That is f***ing crazy. Since they're new, there's no laws regulating them. They operate outside the regulated banking system, also known as the shadow banking system. And since the Fed only ever cares about how much inflation there is for everyday goods like food, clothes, etc., those things weren't going up. Stocks were. We're fine, everything is going amazing. And this is how bubbles usually form. Not from rising inflation where the cost of everyday goods explodes, but an explosion in real estate stocks, assets fueled by people borrowing money thinking that it's only gonna go up. Stocks continue to only go up, just like today. And the higher they went, the more the speculators bet that they would rise even more the lower the lending centers got to borrow money to invest because the lenders were making money hand over fist. This is a new age of prosperity. Stocks are never going to go down. Why stop now? 
kind of like in 2008, don't have income, you get a mortgage. And since prices were so high, the banks looked like they were in good shape. Unless prices go down and people start withdrawing their money, which is never going to happen. Or in other words, the herd was moving in the same greedy direction. While at the same time, the wealth gap in America continued to grow, eventually to the highest point it's ever been until today. And by 1928, the Fed was finally starting to see how troubling all this speculative debt was. So they raised interest rates from the 3.5% that set the bubble in motion to 5%, which was set the next stage of the cycle in motion. Late 1929, the bubble pops. March 1929, the Fed started holding daily secret meetings, but didn't tell the public what the meetings were about. This sparked rumors that the Fed was going to crack down on all this borrowing for stocks. August 1929, the Fed raises rates again from 5% to 6%. And just like how the Fed lowering rates made people borrow more, which cascaded into the market soaring, the Fed raising rates had the exact opposite effect. Since people weren't borrowing to buy stocks as much with the new higher interest rate, no new money came into the market, which made the stock market not grow as much. Since people aren't seeing the crazy returns they're used to, they start to get nervous and pull their money out, and stocks start going down. Since people aren't taking out loans, they have less money to spend. And since the money you spend is another man's income and you're spending less, the next guy's income goes down. Since that next guy's income goes down, he has less money to spend on the next guy. And the bubble feeds on itself downward until it pops. October 19, 1929. The stock market crashes. Trading volume explodes, bankers try to stop the fall. In less than two hours, nearly $10 billion invested in stocks was simply wiped out. Black Thursday turns into Black Monday, which turns into Black Tuesday, and the economy starts to fall off a cliff. 1930 to 1932, Depression. By New Year's Day of 1930, the stock market crashed around 50%. Many thought that the worst was over, but the damage to the economy had already been done. Since the banks that lent out all this money to trade were hurt particularly bad by the stock market crash, even legitimate businesses that needed legitimate loans couldn't get them since the banks were getting squeezed. Like how the railroad industry couldn't get loans even though they were qualified. The railroads were deemed systematically important by the government, like the auto industry in 2008. One of the first decisions that I made as president was to save the US auto industry from collapse. And like how in 2008, investors that were ready with cash in hand to take advantage of this cheap real estate that had more than enough money to pay back new loans couldn't get them. Protectionism and anti-immigration was on the rise, as it usually is during rough times like these. After all, we can't let immigrants take our jobs when there's not enough for us. They took our jobs! They took your jobs! They took your jobs! They took your jobs! People knew that the banks were in trouble, which led to runs on banks. And since banks only keep a portion of the money you deposit on hand, as everyone tries to withdraw their money, the banks couldn't keep up. So banks started failing left and right, with nearly a thousand banks failing in 1930 alone. Watch our video on the business of banking to learn more. December 11th. The biggest bank in the US, Bank of the United States, with around 400,000 depositors, closed its doors. The bank experienced a run the day before that started from a false rumor. Needless to say, if you saw your life savings disappear overnight, it probably wouldn't inspire much confidence in the nation's banking system. If the biggest bank can go down, then no one must be safe. At the same time, 6 million people are out of a job in the US. The bubble bursting has spread across the globe. Combine that with the highest wealth gap ever at the time, unemployment and overall suffering. And populism, nationalism, militarism and extremist leaders have the perfect breeding ground to take power. Like in Germany with you know who, and with Japan invading Manchuria. That vicious cycle downward continues and as money and credit contracts, the economy starts to really fall off a cliff. 1932, the show continues. Congress passes the 1932 Banking Act, allowing the Federal Reserve to print money. 75 years later, we would call this quantitative easing, along with even more powers. And social unrest and conflict continue to rise in the US and around the world. In the US, wages were cut, a drought further ruined farmers, unemployment exploded to 25%, and strikes and protests were on the rise. In Germany, you know who seizes power, and Japan invades Shanghai, sowing the seeds for World War II. And the cycle will continue all the way until things started to recover around 1938. And in 1939, World War II starts. All because you had to borrow money recklessly. 2009, the bubble forms. After the crash of 2008, 
the Fed lowered interest rates down to near 0%. Because just like how the Fed lowering rates in the early 1920s allowed people to borrow more and to spend more, which made incomes go up and the overall economy spiral up, that's what they were intentionally trying to do here. Not to cause another bubble, but to just stimulate the economy. And stimulate they did. And the reason it only went down 50 and, and bounced back relatively quickly was because the Fed came charging in uh, to the rescue. That near 0% interest rate, basically like steroids for the economy, continued for nearly six years. The economy was finally recovering from the Great Recession. We can't be the ones to stop it now. It would be political suicide. And the result? The stock market and housing market's biggest rise ever. Kinda like the 1920s and 2008. And at the same time, a new world power was on the silent rise. China. By 2016, Trump takes office and has the Fed slowly start raising interest rates, the same tightening that caused the crash in 1929. By the start of 2020, the market was reaching a boiling point after 131 months of expansion. And then boom, COVID hits. And the market tanks by 25%. Now, all things considered, one might think the market should have probably felt a lot more than that. But remember, the Fed got the power to print money during the Great Depression. And being that when you give someone power, they typically don't like to give it back, ever since then, the Fed's power and influence has only gotten bigger. We print it digitally. So we, you know, we as a central bank, we have the ability to create money uh, digitally. And the printing that happened after 2008 was just rehearsal time for America's money printer. The entire country was bailed out. Interest rates were lowered to near 0% again after a tiny pause. And by the start of 2021, over 40% of all US dollars were printed in just the last 12 months. Watch our video on why we haven't seen hyperinflation to learn more with the link below. The stock market quickly recovers, the housing market was never really hurt, and both continued their greatest climb ever. And the Great Recession 2.0 was quickly averted. Kinda like how the bursting of the dot-com bubble in the early 2000s was gonna lead to a recession, but the Fed also lowered rates to near 0% back then, which delayed the pain eventually building up to the 2008 crash. And this wasn't a crash in 2020. We did not have a market crash. But 2020 was such a bad year to erupt. No, no, no. People got unemployment benefits. People got stimulus checks sent to them. People got bailed. People got bailed out in so many different ways where people didn't even want to get a job because they were making more money staying home than getting a job. And just like how after the crash in 1929, most people thought the worst was over, most people also think the worst is over. But just like back then, the damage has already been done. If you go back to before the COVID, what you see is we have lost considerable strength in the economy. We have fewer people working and we have a reduced stream of goods and services, and yet the price is much higher. But is it really justified that we have delivered a serious wound to the global economy and the global stock market has gone way up? It doesn't feel right. I think we all know that. Today, the money printer is working at full blast with more stimulus checks apparently coming? Another $1,400 will be coming. I believe that it should go to people who in fact are in need. The sad truth of, of a lot of the quote stimulus is it didn't increase much in the way of, of real production, but it uh, flowed a lot of it eventually into the market one way or the other. Stocks are trading at insane levels and an average of 40 times their earnings, just like in the 20s, 2000 and 2008. To give you some context, stocks usually average around 16 times earnings. The amount of debt people have to finance all this growth is high again, just like in the 20s and 2008. And we have plenty of new financial instruments. Except this time, some of the instruments were created by tech enthusiasts instead of Wall Street, like Bitcoin and Robinhood that gives new investors the easiest access to margin trading, the cause of the Roaring Twenties than ever before. Now to be clear, I am a big fan of this tech, but to think that there's no chance of unintended consequences from this decentralization is the exact kind of thinking that led to the bubbles of the past. Wall Street is also frothing at the mouth over another shiny new financial instrument, SPACs, a new very profitable way to take companies public. So SPACs have always been um, the scummiest thing anyone can ever do in Wall Street. There is absolutely nothing that's a bigger scam period in the history of Wall Street and everybody in Wall Street knows it. A SPAC is simply a convoluted way of saying that, hey, we're gonna take a company public without going through any of the, the regulatory scrutiny that a company needs to go through when they're going public. Which in the first three months of 2021 alone, 
there have been nearly half as many SPACs as the entire year of 2020. Check out this clip about SPACs on our second channel to get a different take on them. And I wouldn't be surprised if Wall Street has other new financial instruments that we haven't heard about until it's already too late, like in 2008. And then there are the rather startling signs that we haven't seen since the 1930s. Number 1. The Rise of Populism At no point in history have we seen a larger wealth gap, income gap, and political polarization than right now and in the 30s. The top one-tenth of one percent of the population's income is equal about to the bottom 90 percent combined. So that type of magnitude of gap uh, has not existed since the 30s. Uh, this is reflecting the political polarity that exists, and you could see that that's um, the highest since about the turn of the century. Now, all I'm just saying is there's a lot of political polarity that's dealing with that. Now, it doesn't matter if you think this is okay or not. What does matter is the resentment and social unrest that rises out of that. Number two, how we're already at near 0% interest rates. If things take another downturn, rates are already near 0% so the Fed won't be able to lower rates any lower. In a recession, lowering interest rates works to stimulate borrowing. However, in a deleveraging, lowering interest rates doesn't work because interest rates are already low and soon hit 0%. So the stimulation ends. So they're going to turn to printing money, stimulus checks, welfare programs, as governments have always done in times like these. Number three, the rise of China to challenge the existing power of the US. The last 16 times a rising power confronted a ruling power, war broke out, also known as Thucydides' trap, just like the world after the 30s. The last time those things happened were in the 1930s. And if you look at history going back over periods of time before that, hundreds of years, I made a point of studying the last 500 years, you could see these patterns in history. Those are the circumstances that we're facing. And so uh, the issue really, I think, is can we face those things in a skillful way and a bipartisan way so that we don't do ourselves uh, even more harm than the circumstances have brought us as a challenge full video on this in the future, subscribe so you don't miss out. But perhaps the most important sign, when average normies, for lack of a better term, that have never ever shown an ounce of interest in investing, start getting into an investment, there's probably a bubble. Why? Because normies that don't know any better are usually the last ones to get in on an investment before it's too late. We saw it happen with the housing bubble, we saw it happen with Bitcoin in 2017, and again with GameStop. And this general feeling of everyone thinking things are only going to go up from here is kind of what's in the air right now. As Warren Buffett says, when people are greedy, it's time to be fearful. I for one cannot wait for the next market crash. There is going to be so much wealth to be made, everything is going to be on sale and my time will finally come. Now you may be saying to yourself, but Jake, that's cruel. People are going to get hurt. How can you be so heartless? Everyone on this planet has the same access to the same knowledge to prepare themselves right now. Many won't. Is that my fault? It's gonna happen anyways. Would it be more moral to not take advantage of it, to not make sure your family is taken care of, when you know full well what's coming, just because others didn't prepare? I think that that is tantamount to intellectual fraud. Just to be clear, I have no idea if this is actually gonna happen. But the philosophy I follow in life is that being that we can't predict the future, you should make sure you come out on top no matter what the future holds. So in closing, I'll leave you with this. History never repeats itself, but man always does. And it's correct that history doesn't necessarily repeat itself, but the cause-effect relationships are the important things to understand, and they are analogous. Say COVID never happened, there is no coronavirus, nothing happened, and 2020 goes the way it did. How does the market go? Where does it go? 35,000? 40,000? That's still a bubble that's been going for 11 years. No econ economy expansion goes for 11 years, and the debt of the country keeps rising the way it's rising for us, and the interest rates, that's not sustainable. Eventually, there is a crash that's going to come, and it's not going to be pretty. Almost everything happens over and over again for the same reasons. Okay. So these debt crises all happen over and over again for the same reasons. They get it overdone. And even if you understand um, it and the cycles well, you can benefit from those cycles rather than to be hurt by those cycles. Because...
And if you want to be ready for the next market crash, the time to start preparing is now. That is where trends comes in. With trends, you can discover emerging industries before you hear about them on the Wall Street Journal, like this signal on the lucrative and not capital intensive business of review sites, like how the site Best Reviews recently sold for $160 million, or this signal on how the explosion of religious apps is finally capturing the attention of venture capitalists, and how being that 80% of America identifies as religious, there could be a lot more VC money that you can take advantage of coming in soon. Market crashes are where millionaires and billionaires are minted. It's when generational wealth is made. But only if you position yourself in a way where you don't just survive the next big crash, but also thrive. That means having plenty of cash to take advantage of this once in a lifetime sale. And the only way you're going to stack cash quickly is with a great business. The clock is ticking. Discover your next big idea by starting your one week trial of trends for the grand sum of just $1 by going to trends.co slash jakeTran. The link is on the screen and in the video description below. Woo! New microphone, let me know how it sounds as I get it dialed in, and a new backdrop of my favorite painting of all time. More details on what it is and why on my Instagram coming soon at jaketrend.io. Don't miss out. Do you think a crash is coming? Let me know in the comments below. I obviously lean towards the side of yes, there is probably a market crash coming. Although again, I'm not going to say with certainty. I just want to make sure that I come out on top whichever way the world goes. This video was based on the book The Big Debt Crisis by Ray Dalio, one of the richest people in the world and the founder of the world's largest hedge fund. An incredible read that does require some basic knowledge of like the Federal Reserve, some basic economics, that kind of thing. And it requires you to watch his free online uh, video on YouTube called How the Economic Machine Works, which is also an incredible video. I will link the book below, but if I were in your shoes, even though I am not some kind of financial advisor or economic advisor of any kind, so you definitely shouldn't listen to what I say, but if I were in your shoes, I would watch that free video by Ray Dalio first, and then I would focus on building your career, your income, your savings first, so you have something to stand on. And then once that is more in place, then you can go into the finer details of a book like this to learn like the nuances and how to really profit from it and like the timing and everything. That is my advice. If you are new to this channel, we make video essays just like this one every single week on the most provocative stuff in the world of business for free. So you might as well subscribe because there's nothing to lose and you can always dislike, unsubscribe, leave me your best hate comments below so you have nothing to lose. That is going to wrap it up for this video. Thank you so much for watching. You've been awesome. I've been Jake. Stay dangerous out there and I will see you guys in the next one.